And good afternoon to everybody. We're delighted to have you with us. I am Ken Edwards, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar, brought to you by QRMD. With me today, I have my favorite presenter, Dr. Gwilym. We'll be discussing how to best prepare for the conclusion of the ICD-10 grace period, and this is slated to occur in about a week and a half from now, on October the 1st of this year. Also happening on the same day is the first update to the ICD-10 code set, about 2,000 new codes, um, some revisions and some deletions to existing ICD codes. So all of that from Dr. Gwilym to uh, coming for you. And if you've attended any of our past webinars, you'll remember the series in which we covered ICD-10 conventions, guidelines, coding strategies, and methods to improve clinical documentation. These webinars are available for you on our website, and they'd be helpful to anybody who's either coming to this fresh or wanting to refresh their understanding of ICD-10. As always, we welcome all your questions, and the GoToMeeting web toolbar on your screen contains a section where you can post these questions. Dr. Gwilym will attempt to answer as many questions as possible today in the time that we have allotted. But since we're going to end the session on the top of the hour, um, if we're unable to get to a certain question today, we'll be posting all the questions and all the answers to the Cure Wiki. So you can go into the Wiki from within QRMD and get your answers. We're also monitoring Twitter. So if you're posting questions using the hashtag QRMDWebinar, we'll be able to pick those up and include them in today's webinar. So our agenda for today is threefold. I'll be talking briefly about how ICD-10 has affected QRMD clients and their claims in particular, and how the provider-friendly terminology feature works in QRMD. Uh, Dr. Gwilym will then help us understand what's changing on October the 1st and how best to approach this change. And towards the end, we will have a Q&A session in all the time that's remaining, and we'll attempt to answer as many questions as possible from you guys. Um, so let's start off with a progress report with respect to what's been happening uh, with QRMD, and specifically with respect to ICD-10. So this happened about a year ago on October the 1st, 2015. And the first thing that we were looking at um, is how claim submissions changed or how ICD-10 usage changed over that period. So we, we started seeing a, a tremendous drop in claims being submitted using ICD-9 codes. And for about two weeks, we continued to have some ICD-9 claims being submitted, after which everything switched over to ICD-10. And, and part of this was because we sort of forced all of our clients to start coding in ICD-10 as of October the 1st. So very quickly, all of our clients wrapped up, and, and we really appreciate the work that you guys put in, following the webinars, doing this, those trainings, and getting up to speed with this change. Um, related to that, of course, was what happened with our denials. So we saw a spike in our denials around the change. Um, this happened a couple of times with some pairs who were not prepared, but Overall, most pairs were uh, very timely with the change. They had tested their systems, and it did go off without too much of a hitch. So everybody was, was pretty happy with this. We also had a huge spike in calls coming through to our help desk, so that most of those were on the first day. But uh, with the trainings that you guys have taken and with the preparation that everybody had done, uh, it went through very smoothly. And this year, we also have additional staff available to assist you on the first if that becomes a need. Uh, but we anticipate that this change will go through even smoother. Also, related to that, was uh, our performance metrics with respect to claims being submitted from QRMD. So we've been monitoring these from prior to 10-1-2015 and over the past year. And the EDI rate, so the number of claims being submitted electronically, that percentage has increased a little bit. Uh, the rejection rates from within CureConnect, from within uh, our own claim scrubber from within the front end systems at pairs before the claim gets into processing. That's been fairly stable, but it's, been, it's, it's become a little bit higher. And overall, claim denial rates are also very stable. So this change hasn't been what we expected it to be, a huge you know, disruptor of claims and, and uh, revenue cycle. So related to that, of course, we introduced a feature last year, and this is not a new feature as such, but it's, it's a feature that not many of our clients are using. And we've been monitoring this over the past year, and we're reintroducing this this year. Uh, when you go into QRMD and you attempt to search for, for a diagnosis through any of the clinical screens, there's a button there labeled PFT, and that stands for provider-friendly terminology. So the basic thing that, that that kind of search does is it takes an abbreviation that you have for a specific diagnosis, for example, HTN for hypertension, and it understands what that means and it gives you all the related terms with respect to that abbreviation. But 
What it does more importantly, and what will apply as of the 1st of October this year, is that if you come up with a diagnosis that is or that is nonspecific, the system identifies to you whether you are required to choose a more specific diagnosis uh, by color coding that diagnosis, and it also gives you attributes. So, for example, uh, let's say you pick up a, a, a diabetes diagnosis code and you use the most basic one. Now, based on the attributes of the patient, for example, the kind of complications that they're experiencing with diabetes, the system with one click by selecting that particular complication will give you the specific code that you need to use as opposed to having to scroll through maybe the 200 diabetes codes that are available in ICD-10. So this is an existing feature. This is in QRMD, and we'd like more and more of you guys to start using it uh, if you feel that this helps you do your, your, your coding, this helps you do your complete your clinical documentation. Um, and with that, uh, let's introduce our speaker for the day. This is Dr. William. He's one of the few clinicians who became certified with ICD-10 uh, or certified as an ICD-10 instructor. His credentials also include certified professional coding instructor, medical compliance specialist, and certified professional medical auditor. So he actually knows what auditors will be looking for when they go over uh, your documentation and your claims in the near future with these changes in ICD-10. He's also the Vice President and Chief Product Officer of the Cairo Code Institute and Find a Code that provides coding, documenting, and reimbursement guidance and education to physicians and coders. He also writes books, articles, um, and is a sought-after seminar speaker. So we love him. We, we're glad to have him back. Dr. William, over to you. Hey, thanks a lot, Ken. Um, it is always a pleasure to be here. You know, when I, when I did this webinar series for you last year, it was kind of a the sky is falling, you know, end of the world, and, and we better make sure everything is ready. And the information you just shared with us makes it pretty clear that, yeah, there was some nervousness, but, you know, it, it was okay. It wasn't that bad. And this year, there's some changes. There's some stuff going on that you need to understand and be prepared for. But uh, compared to last year, it's going to be even even less stressful. Okay, however, it is worth um, taking a little time today and going through a few things and some strategies you can employ that will minimize any bumps that you might experience. And that's my, my purpose with everyone here today. I, I really want you to, uh, to just know what, what few things you need to do. There's going to be a little bit of effort I would recommend that you take. Um, I'm going to cover actually two things with regards to October 1st uh, in a few weeks. And that is I'd like to take a few moments to take you through a quick summary of of all the new revised and deleted codes. Uh, I can't obviously go through all of them, but I'm going to go through uh, a summary of them because I want, as you're listening, I want you to, to uh, pick up when I identify something that you reuse in your, in your clinics. Um, I want you to, uh, I'll, I'll explain what I want you to do with that information in a few moments, okay? And then we'll spend most of the time here talking about the end of this grace period, the flexibility that CMS offered with regards to ICD-10 documentation. Um, and, and I'll explain to you uh, two strategies that I've devised that you can use to make sure that you can stand up to an audit with, that compares your ICD-10 codes to your documentation, okay? So first, I'd like to go through a summary with you of the code changes that occur that will occur um, in a week and a half. There were about 2,000 new codes added to the code set, about 400 revised codes, and about 300 deleted codes. And these are estimates, so about 2,700 changes total. And it's, uh, you know, a common question is, well, is this like a whole new big thing? Do I have to change everything I'm doing? Well, it really depends. Uh, as I'll show you in a moment, um, depending on your specialty, there may be no changes that impact you. There really be nothing at all. Um, but if you're in a different specialty, you might have a lot you need to be looking at. And it's important to be aware of that because you do not want claims to be delayed or slowed down simply because of, of code selection. Now, I also want to warn you that uh, the codes will change and be updated every year on October 1st. And uh, we expect next year to have far fewer revisions. It's been four years since the code set got updated. Um, it was frozen to help us make the transition, and they told us they'd keep it frozen for a year. So there's a lot of new codes and changes this year because it had been so long. So next year should be even easier, okay? And then as soon as you got the hang of this, ICD-11 will come out, and it'll, you know, change the whole thing, which, by the way, I think you got, you know, five to ten years before you really need to worry about ICD-11. Um, but it's coming, and it'll be another, you know, another big deal, but we'll, we'll make it through. Um, the thing is, I like ICD-10. I think that the code set is um, logical. I think that it's, it's useful, and I think that it actually, based on the strategies I'll share with you in the last half of this presentation, I think it can help you become better documenters. And as someone who does audits uh, and audits documentation, 
Um, it's nice to have tools to help you. So IC10 can help you document better. And I'll show you how later. First, um, there are 21 chapters of codes in ICD-10 in the, in the tab you're list. And each chapter is a different body system or condition. So on this slide, I'm showing you um, the first six chapters and a quick summary of what changed in each chapter. So let's say that you work in a behavioral health setting. Um, then you might be interested in looking at chapter five down there. Um, let's say that you work in uh, you know, uh, internal medicine. Then you probably need to take a look at chapter four um, there's a lot of diabetic code changes and things like that. And we'll, we'll actually do a diabetic code example here um, for the second half of this presentation. So let me just take you through each of these and summarize for you. Chapter one is your infectious diseases. Um, these are a, codes that start with the letter A. There's one new code, the Zika virus, which is kind of the big scare this year. Um, but other than that, no ch changes, so no big deal. The neoplasm chapter only had seven new codes, so a few revisions as well. There's not much going on there, and if you work in oncology, you should figure out what those seven new codes are, and I'll show you where to look in just a moment, um, and you should make sure you know what they are, and if you don't work in oncology, then no big deal, no skin off your nose. Uh, chapter three is the um, blood-related disorders. There's nine new codes and revisions to post-procedural complications. A lot of the revisions that were made um, to ICD-10 were revisions to post-procedural complications and other chapters, too. So you'll see um, on the next few slides a lot of mention of post-procedural complications in different chapters. So chapter four, as I mentioned, is your endocrine and metabolic disease chapter. And this is where you'll see um, codes that pertain to diabetes. Uh, the diabetic retinopathy codes, for the most part, I mean, there's a few changes with proliferative, proliferative versus non-proliferative and severity and laterality. But for most of them, it's, it's, it's eyeball stuff. They added codes for bilateral. Um, or right or left, and they didn't have that before. So that added a lot of new codes, and that's pretty easy to figure out, but you just gotta make sure you know what those codes are and you use them properly. Because if you build with the old codes that got deleted, you'd you, you know, be in bad shape. Chapter five is your mental and behavioral health disorders. Um, these are the F codes. Uh, there's only 12 new codes for hoarding. Um, if you're like me, I hoard coding books. If you could see my office behind me, I've got piles and piles of books. I'm a hoarder. Um, obsessive compulsive disorders, helpful for, for auditors like me. Um, and, and social pragmatic communication disorder, which I might have too. Um, chapter six is your nervous system diagnoses. The, what they did there was there was all these codes for different nerve-related issues in the extremities, and we had codes for right and left, but they didn't have a bilateral. And it, previously then you would have coded both codes if you needed to, but now they added bilateral. So if someone has bilateral carpal tunnel or bilateral tarsal tunnel, then there's a code for that instead of doing right and left separately, okay? So that's just a few changes, no big deal. You just gotta figure out what they are, make sure you're aware of, of what needs to happen. As we keep going through the chapters of ICD-10, chapter seven is your eye conditions. Um, and there's new codes for um, a lot of um, ophthalmoplegic conditions uh, with glaucomas and macular degeneration. And, and so there's actually a lot of changes in this chapter. And if you work uh, in, in that field, you definitely have a little bit of homework to do. Okay, there's quite a few changes there. I think there's about 100. Um, for chapter eight, which is the ear codes, just a few changes there. There's some new codes for tinnitus and post-procedural complications. Uh, chapter nine is the circulatory diseases and disorders, a lot of eye codes. These are the ones that start with the letter I. Um, there's new codes for cerebral infarction, deficits due to hemorrhage and cardiovascular disease, dissection of arteries, and then post-procedural complications. So if you work in cardiac, um, you got some homework to do as well. Now, if you work in, in pulmonary medicine, respiratory, not much going on there. Four new codes, couple of revisions. They're post-procedural complications. Okay, so not much to worry about there. Chapter 11 is your digestive um, codes, and there's some dental code changes. So if you work in dentistry, that's important to note. Uh, some, some more specificity with colitis, infections, pancreatitis, and again, post-procedural complications. Those are showing up in multiple chapters. As, so we're halfway through. I just want to summarize the other um, nine chapters, another 10 chapters for you. Chapter 12 is for the skin. You work in dermatology, five new codes for you to worry about, and then a few revisions to post-procedural complications. So uh, dermatology, not, not a big deal, but you should find out what those five new codes are and check them out. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through all 2,700 changes with you in this presentation. Chapter 13 is your musculoskeletal disorders. A lot of changes here, actually. Um, they added codes for bunions and bunionettes, which weren't there before. Uh, there's new codes for pain in joints of the hand. For temporal mandibular joints, they add a, um, right and left and bilateral, um, so you can specify which side of the jaw the condition is. Uh, cervical disc disorders, um, they added more specificity for the levels instead of just saying mid-cervical. 
Uh, and then some fracture codes exist in Chapter 13, and those got some updates and changes. These are mostly pathological fractures. The traumatic fractures we'll see are in Chapter 19, and, and there's a lot of changes actually to those. I'll show you a few of those in a moment. Uh, chapter 14 is genital urinary, so if you work in that field, um, there's actually quite a few changes there too. New codes for urinary incontinence, prostatic dysplasia, testicular and scrotal pain, erectile dysfunction, ovarian cysts, fallopian tube problems, and the complications of the urinary tract. Now, if you're listening to this and you go, you know what, um, in our clinic, in my role, we do deal with uh, you know, urinary incontinence or, or, or prostate problems. I, I'm telling you this because I, I want you to take a note now and say, oh, I better go back and check those out. I better go take a look at these if, if that's familiar to you. And if you work in a field where you do not deal with genital urinary conditions, then don't worry about it. Um, you know, but, so I'm asking you to listen for something that sounds familiar to you. I put together a summary so you could pull those out, and then you need to go in and look at the details because we can't go through them all here. Uh, chapter 15 is our pregnancy codes. Uh, so these start with the letter O, and um, there's a few changes there. Our topic pregnancy, um, some other complications, placenta previa. So just take a look, and if those apply to you, by all means, dig deeper. Uh, chapter 16 is the perinatal conditions. Um, there's a lot of revisions to effects on the newborns from conditions of the mother. Uh, and a couple of new codes for newborn weight. Chapter 17 is your congenital codes. You start with the letter Q. Um, and there's new codes for a few, a few conditions there, aorta abnormalities, vaginal septum, malformations, and some foot problems. Now, Chapter 18 had a lot of changes. This is your signs and symptoms chapter, which um, you'll, you'll find codes here for, that you would use when you know what the patient's symptoms are or what the signs are or what their abnormal lab findings are but you don't know what the condition is yet, and then you'd use this. So you can see that they added a bunch of codes for the stroke scores from NIHSS, um, you know, microscopic hematuria, micturition issues, and then the Glasgow Coma Score, there's a whole bunch of codes there to separate out the different types of coma. Um, bacteria, abnormal radiologic findings, so abnormal lab findings are also found in Chapter 18. Um, so there's some new codes for some radiology issues, and then some stuff with prostate-specific antigen. And the last three chapters here, the last few, um, we have chapter 19 is your injury and poisoning codes. Lots of changes here. And if you work in uh, emergency room, um, family practice, I mean, anywhere you're dealing with accidents, injuries, poisoning, um, you, there's a lot of changes here. And mostly it's to the fracture codes. Just some clarification on the wording. Um, for example, um, changes to skull fractures, jaw dislocations. I think it was some right and left and some um, bilateral things they added there. Um, some concussion codes were deleted because the experts decided that um, they were classified incorrectly in ICU-10. The true definition of concussion, it, it, it's under 60 minutes, I believe, of, of loss of consciousness. And so those were classified elsewhere under other brain injuries. Um, now, Salter-Harris is a type of fracture, and they added the hyphen. And there were dozens and dozens of codes that changed because they added a hyphen. So, again, no big deal, but it is a revision, so it's noted there and it's listed. Um, so changes to some nerve injuries, uh, foot fractures, um, prosthetic device complications, cardiac stents, uh, urethral catheter, catheters, so complications with um, prosthetic devices like catheters, vaginal mesh, and so on, neurostimulator complications. So if, you, if these sound familiar to you, you got, you got to need to look into those as well. Uh, chapter 20 is your external cause codes. Not required, but they can be reported voluntarily. These codes explain the circumstances of where someone was or what they were doing when they suffered an injury or a poisoning, um, generally. There were just a few changes to some vehicular collisions with fixed objects. Um, and there are some new codes that are important to everybody that have to do with paper cuts. So we couldn't report paper cuts properly before, now we can, and other sharp objects. Also, some interesting codes about overexertion. So you can report that's what someone was overexerted when they were injured. And then um, one of my favorites is choking game. There, there's now a code for someone who's injured during playing the choking game, which I've never played, but if any of you want to get together later, we can try it out. Um, chapter 21 is your health status code. So these were your old friends of V-codes back in ICD-9. They're all Z-codes now, and they're for describing an encounter. So, so you would use these codes to say, the patient's coming in for an encounter, not for a disease or something, just for a checkup or whatever. And there's some new ones here for observation of newborn, hormone malignancy status, prophylactic medications, uh, some stuff for contraceptives. Um, I believe we got a question in about contraceptives, uh, about was there a change, and there was. I, I looked it up just before the presentation. There are six new codes for contraceptives that are a little more specific. Um, for encounters for that, and so that's good to know. You should check them out. They're, they're Z30 codes. Um, and then there's a few changes to endoscopic procedures and some history. So that is your five-minute version of all the changes, all the 2,700 changes. 
um, to ICD-10 this year. Uh, now, let's say, okay, you identified a few of those you need to check out. Well, um, this is this is a, a, the ICD-10 page on Find a Code, all right, and these are all the tools we have um, for ICD-10, um, which which is a library. This is going far beyond um, just you know plugging the code in to your claim. This is if you want to do some research and you want to dig a little deeper. And I highlighted here on the left um, just uh, some lists here. We have uh, new codes, deleted codes, change codes. So you could go to this list on the ICD-10 page on Find a Code. Um, and you could say, I want to look at the, the new codes for 2017, or I want to look at the deleted codes. So let's say I want to take a look at those deleted codes. Um, and there are 311 deleted codes, uh, if you want to get specific. And here's the list of, of codes that were deleted as of October 1st, or will be deleted as of October 1st. And if I am in a clinic where we deal with diabetes, then I need to go down and take a look at, here's the diabetes that start at the top of this list that were deleted. You scroll all the way down and look for the ones that apply to you, you know, based on, on the types of conditions you see. So um, I, I, I summarized the changes for you, and I'm telling you that uh, it's useful to go in and take a few moments to look at the changes that you identified that I mentioned um, in one of these lists that shows which ones that you use that were either added or deleted or revised. Um, another tool that I want to show you quickly that's just in Find a Code um, is an ICD-10 code validator. You can copy and paste the code. So here I've got A09, K52, and K59. I hit validate on there, and it will show me which codes belong together and which ones don't. So it turns out that if you just look at K K52.9 at the top, which is for a non-infective gastroenteritis, um, there's an error there. I can't report with A09. Now I know, um, and I can quickly summarize that. Uh, there's also a warning that says it's so you can get errors, warnings, and notes. And the error says don't do these. The warning says, hey, this is not specific, so make sure that's your best choice. And the notes provide extra details straight from the code set. Um, the, the other way to do this is to take a coding book and flip it open and search through. And that's no fun. Nobody wants to go through all that trouble. So I just want you to know there are tools out there available that can simplify the process as you're trying to become more expert with the codes that you use. Um, and, and many of these types of tools are also inside your CureMD software if you're a CureMD user. Um, and if not, you know, you can consider a, a, a library like Find a Code uh, and check that out. So having kind of gone through that, I want to shift gears now and talk to you about the end of the flexibility from CMS. And, and by the way, one of the questions is if, if CMS is not going to be flexible with my ICD-10 codes, are other payers going to do it too? And and in general, the answer is, yeah, well, everyone's going to do what Medicare does. Um, but the truth is, it's possible that Blue Cross has already been looking at this. They didn't have to follow Medicare's example. Or it's possible that Blue Cross doesn't care, and they're not going to do this. I don't know for sure. I don't have any inside um, you know, information with Blue Cross. But I want you to know that in general, for the industry, um, since Medicare said they weren't going to heavily scrutinize your documentation versus your codes, and now they say they will, it's possible, worst case scenario, every record you've ever written that has an IC10 code associated with it that could be audited uh, with a fine tooth comb. And, and we want to make sure that if that happens, that you can provide documentation that supports the codes. Um, so, so first, make sure you're, you're clear with the updated codes. But now, also make sure your documentation supports the codes you select. And frankly, you know, the same rule is here that we've, we've heard forever. Don't use unspecified codes if you can help it. Um, if your documentation supports something that's more detailed, then you should definitely code for the more detailed thing. Because unspecified codes are going to be triggers for auditors to go in and take a look and see what you're doing. Um, they're going to, they're going to, um, it, it's easier for them to suspect something's going on if they see an unspecified code. They think you're just being lazy and you're not coding properly. And so it behooves you to find the more detailed code and use it because uh, you're going to stand up better to scrutiny and you're going to have um, better records in general uh, and better codes. So they shouldn't be as quick to deny. In fact, they may deny just because it's even unspecified, even though it's justified. Um, so just know that unspecified codes are okay to use. They just um, should only be used if they're the best option you have. And by the way, the quote on this slide is from Medicare. And they're basically saying, you got to code accurately to reflect the clinical documentation. That's the bottom line. Um, so figure out what documentation is required for your most commonly Use codes. I taught this last year too, but I've had a year to look at it and to audit some records, and, and, and I'm refining a little bit of what um, what I've shared in the past to help you get even closer to um, actionable steps you can follow to make sure that you don't have payment problems simply because uh, your documentation and your codes are, are not quite lined up. So this this graphic here is is kind of the my summary, my view of 
of the flow of information and the reimbursement between a patient encounter and a payer. So if we start on the left, a patient shows up for care and gets, you know, has a condition and, and, and gets evaluated. Um, so the next step is the provider treats or documents what happened and does some testing and figures out what's going on and, and, and comes up with a diagnosis and then does some procedures. That information is conveyed on a claim form that a biller or coder will help to create. And that's kind of the, the third box from the left that says biller or coder creates a claim. Now, ideally, if I were to compare these three things, they'd all match perfectly. If I interviewed the patient or they were examined under oath, um, and then I looked at the documentation and I looked at the claim form, all three of those should line up perfectly and everybody would agree that everything is, is right on. Um, the concern is that you might document accurately, but it doesn't get conveyed to the claim form correctly. And so we want to make sure that you can align your claim form to reflect exactly what was documented. Um, I also don't want you to document or, or put, sorry, put things on the claim form simply because the payer told you to. It's not okay to pick codes based on the payer's guidance without looking at the documentation. So the concern that payers may come across is they say, well, we know this guy always puts these codes because he thinks they get, they, they're, they're better for establishing medical necessity. But when we look at the records, we see that that wasn't really what the patient had. And so I want you to understand that we also have to make sure this aligns with the payer's policies and so on, but we can't choose the code based upon the payer. We can let the payer's policies influence our code choice, but at the bottom line is it always must show up on the claim the same way it was documented, which should reflect what really happened in the encounter. Okay, and, and as an auditor, that's what I'm always looking for. When I review records, that's what I want to see. So I'm going to give you two tools here to make sure that you can keep all those parties happy and the flow of information clear. I'm going to show you how to, this, how to create provider documentation guides first, and then we'll talk about a problem statement, which is something that's kind of already built into CureMD, um, but I'm going to talk about the mechanics behind it and, and what you need to be thinking as you create one of these. So um, provider documentation guides is a very manual process. This is, this is a sit-down training with a provider. And, you know, I know we have a, a wide uh, variety of people in the audience here. We have a big audience, and, and some of you may work in different roles. Right now, as I talk to you about provider documentation guides, or I'm going to call it a PDG for short, um, these are really um, best for the provider to sit down with their coding and billing people and spend 15, 20 minutes once a week learning to document a certain diagnosis better. Okay, it's, it's an exercise. Now, these provider documentation guides can include whatever information you think is important, but here's what I think is important. And so you can see here there's five kind of groups of information. And what I'm doing is I'm going to take a single condition and I'm going to create a guide, um, a documentation guide for a provider to use as a reference that includes all this information, hopefully on a single sheet of paper, on, on a single page, um, or maybe a page and a half because some of them are a little longer. So I want to know, and, and this is what I think a provider needs to know to make sure they can document properly. And, and here's what I'm going to suggest you do. Um, look at your practices and say, what are the top 10 conditions that we use? What are the diagnoses that we see the most often, the top 10? And for those 10, create 10 documentation guides with this information on it. Um, and you can come back later and watch this recording um, or take a screenshot of this. I'll show this slide again in a few moments too. But basically, I want first, what's the condition that I'm coding for? Uh, and, and what code range does it fall into? Is there an ICD-9 equivalent just for you know, history's sake. Um, I, I created a space in these guides for helpful information. And so I've added in there definitions of terms because some of you may realize that you have providers who um, have defined and said something the same way for 30 years, and then ICD-10 says it a different way. So uh, it's nice for this guide to say, well, in ICD-10 it uses these phrases, and here's what these mean. Um, and that could be helpful reference for coders who maybe are newer and don't know anatomy or the terminology as well. Uh, or for providers who are a little old school and use terms that aren't the same as what ICD-10 uses. And then in that section, I also have a summary of what follows, which is what do you need to document for this condition? I have a summary, but I'll, I'll show you how we expand on that when I show you this guide that I've created for um, diabetes. And then we also put in there the guidelines at the level of the chapter and the block, and then we start breaking down each character. The third character, we give you two bits of information. What needs to be documented to support that third character? And what guidelines are available at that category level that we need to understand to make sure we code correctly? And then we do the exact same thing for the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh characters if they apply. 
because as you know, some ICD-10 codes are only three characters long, but most of them are going to be five or six characters, and many of them also have seven characters. So at each character, I'm going to summarize on this guide what needs to be documented to, for that character particularly, and what guidelines are available at that level that I need to be aware of. Okay? So this is the information, and here's the sample of one of these, these guides that, that, um, that I've created. Um, this is for type 2 diabetes mellitus with neurological complications. In fact, we've just begun updating our guides, and we've added HCCs um, because we think it's a pretty big deal. One of the buzzes in, in healthcare reimbursement and in compliance right now is, is hierarchical condition categories, or HCCs. Um, and type 2 diabetes mellitus with neurological complications falls into HCC 18. Um, so that's useful information um, potentially, and so we've begun to add it to these guides. I mean, you can do whatever you want. You can add whatever you think is important, but um, that's what we've thrown in here um, for this guide. So let's assume that, that one of you listening to this presentation, you, you're in your clinics, you have patients with diabetes with neurological complications. This is something you see. Um, so what you would do is go through the steps to create this guide um, and, and, you know, type this up and squeeze it onto a page, and then you would have this guide created, and your provider would have it sitting there for a week or two. And every time they saw a patient with this condition, they would scan it and use this to help make sure their documentation is up to speed. Okay? They would use this as a reference. And hopefully, after a couple of weeks of, of this, they would go, you know what, I'm very comfortable with what's required for the um, type 2 diabetes with neurological complication ICD-10 codes and I don't need to look at the guide anymore. And then it gets recycled or passed on to someone else who needs more help. So these groups of codes fall between um, E11.40 to E11.49. So it's the E114 subcategory, and that's, again, type 2 diabetes with neurological problems. So we've identified the HCC it belongs to, which is an important part of the future of reimbursement, which is a, another topic. In fact, maybe if we have time at the end, um, Ken can talk to you a little bit about uh, macro and MIPS, and, and HCC sort of plays into all that value-based reimbursement, but it's a whole other issue. Um, so you can see here I've highlighted what to document. Um, so if, I, if I'm using these codes, I need to clearly document what type of diabetes it is for the third character. For the fourth character, I need to specify which organ system was, is complicated here. And then for the fifth character, I have to say what the complication is. Okay, and that's a nice summary, but it doesn't actually help me because I don't know what the details are. I don't have multiple choice in front of me. The rest of this guide will, will provide all the other details. I also have um, some extra tips here from this group of codes. We're also supposed to document the insulin use and any oral anti-diabetic drugs or hypoglycemic drugs. So I need to uh, make sure I'm aware of that because it must be documented because you should add those codes based on the directions given in the tab of your list. And then I've also added a bunch of terminology here. Because these are the phrases used in the ICD-10 code set, so I've simply looked them up in a medical dictionary and thrown the definitions in here in case somebody who's using this guide needs that. And either, either again, a provider who's a little old school and it doesn't use the same words that people use nowadays, or maybe a biller or coder who's not as familiar with the terminology. It's all right there to help us so that we know what we're looking at when we start digging into the codes. That's the first part of this guide. Um, the next part is we start getting into guidelines at the chapter and the um, block level. And so I've just kind of highlighted them here for, for Chapter 4, where these codes live. There's some notes there about what to do in case of neoplasms, and there's an excludes one that applies to the whole chapter. Um, there's also, at the level of this particular block, which is the diabetes block, there are some general guidelines in Section 1C, Paragraph 15G, um, that you should check out, that you should understand if you code from this. Um, so I could have discovered that if I had opened a coding book, but I would have had to flip back to the beginning of the block and the chapter to identify this. So I, what I've done is I pulled it out of the book and I've dumped it onto uh, a cheat sheet for my provider. Then we start getting into each character for this code. And it turns out that the third character identifies the type of diabetes mellitus. And we've already said that we're looking at type 2 diabetes, so E11 is type 2. Um, if we were looking at type 1, we'd use E10. Or if we were looking at drug-induced diabetes, we'd look at E09. Um, so we need to make sure provider documents which type of diabetes it is. A simple statement of diabetes mellitus would not support the codes. Um, or you'd have to say unspecified diabetes, and I'm not even sure if there is a code for that. So we keep working our way down. This next um, section here shows us the fourth character information. And there's a ton of stuff here. I actually purposefully picked a complex one. Um, this is Diabetes just has a lot of stuff going on there. Um, if we'd done other conditions, they're not, they're not quite as involved. Um, so in this case, this is just the information for the fourth character for type 2 diabetes. And the first thing I need to know at the top, I've, put, I've listed, what do I need to document for the fourth character for type 2 diabetes? 
I need to document the organ system complications. And if you go down there, you can see that E114 is for neurological complications, and that's the one I'm looking at. If I had chosen the three for my fourth character, it would be ophthalmic, or if I had chosen the five, it would be circulatory. Um, so you can see that there are five specific types of, or, or rather, uh, five specific organ systems that are commonly associated with um, complications with type 2 diabetes. And then there's the E11.6 for others that I might specify that don't fall into those first five. And then you have your unspecified option, and then you have no complications. So I've got lots to look at here um, and lots to consider. The other thing I need to to bring in, into consideration here is the guidelines. It turns out at the fourth character level, there's lots and lots of guidelines here. You've got includes notes, you've got use additional code instructions, you've got excludes ones, um, and then you've got general guidelines to go back and check out. So I summarized it all right here on this guide for my provider and or coder to use as a reference, as opposed to looking up each code and each guideline all, all at once um, through the book or, or another method. And then I get to the fifth character, and for the fifth character for the E114s, I must document the complicating factor. Um, so what's what's going on? I know it's a neurological system, but what is it? Um, and so it looks like here I can choose one of these characters or six options, and they specify the type of neurological problem. Okay, it's a zero, one, two, three, four, or nine. Now I put space here for the six and seven characters, and for additional notes, um, this code only goes out to five characters, and it's done. But I did this because I'm going to make a bunch of these guides, and I. I want them to look similar and be easy for me to follow, so I, I, I'm going to standardize them and always list space for 6th and 7th, even if it doesn't apply, just so that I, I have these guides looking similar. Um, in my company, what we've done is we've taken these and dumped them into these specialty-specific coding books. And if you're old school and you still like coding books, we have some great ones, so come check those out at, at Find a Code. So what we've just done is we, we've created a tool that can be used by a coder and a provider to make sure they're on the same page and to help train them. Uh, again, this is the same slide I showed you a few moments ago. This is the information in these guides. Um, there's, there's the conditions summarized, helpful information that we've tossed in there that we thought were useful, like terminology and definitions. Um, then we've reviewed the guidelines um, at the chapter and block as well as at each character level. Um, and we specified what must be documented for each character. So all of that leads to a tool that can be used for training purposes to help you. And I would suggest that you pick the the top 10 conditions that you code for the most often, and you get really good at documenting for those 10 conditions. And, and if you do, I think that will greatly decrease the chances of an audit that could go awry or that, where you might look not so um, shiny when it comes down to the, uh, a review by an outsider. So there, were, there are, are two tools that I want to show you. The first one is this provider documentation guides, or PDGs. The second one is these... Uh, diagnostic or problem statements. Um, so again, in your software, I believe in QMD, they're called problem statements. I like to call it a diagnostic statement, but it's the same thing. It's basically, um, in a nutshell, it's a summary of what is um, what the codes are. So it's it's a way to take what you see on your screen now is a sample. It's a real note. Right? This is from a real record, and um, and as a as someone who's a coder or an auditor, I could go through this and try to pull out what the codes are. In fact, I'll show you how to, we'll do that right now. We'll find out what the codes are for these conditions. Um, but what I'd really love is if there was a nice, concise problem statement or diagnostic statement that simply says, here's the information you need to support the diagnosis codes. I don't want to have to wade through these couple paragraphs because it's too much work. And what if, heaven forbid, you have a reviewer who doesn't understand your, your specialty? and doesn't know how to break down this paragraph and look for the right key terms. I want to give that reviewer exactly what they're looking for, and I want to summarize it in a problem statement. And I'll show you how I'm going to create a problem statement from this note um, in a few moments. So this patient has diabetes mellitus type 2, and as you read through the paragraph, you see that they're, they're taking insulin, they're monitoring their glucose at home. They also have hyperlipidemia, and it says that they've got problems with you know, protein in the urine, uh, a couple things are okay. Um, and then they use this word that, that intrigues me. They say um, hypertriglyceridemia. And they talk about that a couple times in that record. And I go, well, that word's even longer than hyperlipidemia. Maybe that's more specific. And I should look at the codes really closely to see if, you know, I want to make sure that I can code as specifically as possible. I don't want to use unspecified codes if I can help it. And I see some big words in here that might help me code properly in this case or, or code more accurately. Um, so... What we're going to do is take this note, and we'll start with the diabetes first, 
and we're going to try to figure out what the right code is for this. It says diabetes mellitus type 2, they're taking insulin. So if I want to find a code to try to, to search this, and you can do this inside of your CureMD software as well, um, I would just type in diabetes mellitus, right? And I'm just going to say, oh, well, this patient has diabetes mellitus, so I'll just search for it. And so I'm using the, the find a code tool, and here's the, the comprehensive search page where it shows me the, the results. And you can see there that um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that came up in the results. And on the left, I've selected the code set I want to search for. So I'm not searching CPT or ICD-9 or HCPT right now. Um, I've only selected ICD-10-CM for this example. Um, the problem is all, the stuff that I've highlighted there, the bottom half of the screen, that's all over the place. It's not clear enough. Fortunately, as I look at um, the purple boxes kind of in the middle of your screen, it says, well, here's some suggestions for you. Um, you might want to try one of these things to narrow it down. And sure enough, I see type 2 there. I'm okay, so I click on type 2, and it adds it to my search at the top. So I've got type 2 now added to my search, and now it's much more specific for my search results. Um, and I can see there's E11. There's also other E11s that are more specific, but I need to go in from a general and then narrow it down. So I'm going to go ahead and click on E11 there, which is type 2 diabetes mellitus. And it takes me to a page that shows me all the E11s available to me. Um, I'm still not quite sure what to do, so I need to analyze this. And I say, well, it looks like the fourth character tells me, you know, the organ system that's been complicated. Okay, well, that's good to know. But you know what? As I reflect back on my record, they didn't say anything about complications. So I'm going to assume that what I really want is this code at the bottom of the screen, E11.9, um, without complications, because they weren't mentioned in the record. So I go to that, that code now, and I can see, once I get to the actual code page, in find a code, um, there's a ton of information there. Um, so here's my code, and there's all the includes and excludes at the level of the category, the block, and the chapter. Um, one that's particularly important to this case is it says use additional code to identify insulin use. So I need to do that um, because that was mentioned in the record, which is good to know. Um, also, if I were to scroll down on the screen, I would see all the other menus available to me. In find a code, you can actually get to a lot of extra information on the codes. These all these bars you see here, each one is a menu that pops open when you hit the plus sign. And there's tons more information just on this one code um, if you really need to get into it. And this is very useful for someone who works in claims review or auditing or if you need to do a little bit of homework and research. Okay, so I'll come back to what code I'm, I'm going to use. But first, let's take a look at the second condition this patient has. The second thing was documented, which is hyperlipidemia. Okay, and again, take a look at this. And you read through this note, and it has a bunch of stuff in there. The doctor's really smart. They're taking care of the patient. Okay. But I'm intrigued by the words hypertriglyceridemia. So I type in hyperlipidemia in the search because that's what is highlighted here in bold in yellow you know, by the, by the provider. This was their record. They said hyperlipidemia. That's what this patient has. All right. So I type hyperlipidemia into my search. And um, I'm intrigued by this E78.1 that's the search finding I get here because it has hyperglyceridemia, which is kind of like that hypertriglyceridemia that I saw in the note. I want to stay away from these unspecified codes if I can help it. So I'm going to, I'm going to investigate this more specific one first. Okay, E78.1. So I go to E78.1, and I see a couple of words that are close to what was in my record. And I go, well, maybe this is the right code. You know, it's, it's specific. Um, it has triglycerides and hyperglyceridemia in there. And my record said hypertriglyceridemia. So I'm kind of I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, if, if I was an expert in these types of conditions and I knew the differences, and honestly, I'll, be, I'll confess to you guys right now. I, I'm a little rusty. It's been a few years since I was in a chemistry class. I could tell you the difference between these um, a few years back, but I, I don't really know. And, and I want you to assume that whoever's reviewing your records may not know either. Um, so the deal is you've got to spell it out for the reviewer. It has to be what, they, what you expect them to know. You've got to treat the reviewer as if they are uh, not too bright. You've got to give them exactly what they need. So I'm going to click on the book view, which shows me how these codes look in the book. And I see my E78.1 there, but I look around and I go, well, there's other E78s that might apply. And I go, you know, I better take a look at the unspecified code because I don't know if my record really supports that more specific condition or not. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at E785. And I click on that, and I'm taking oops, to that code, and I just see that um, it's the unspecified hyperlipidemia code. There's not much going on there. Um, but you know what? If I look at my record here, I just don't know for sure if I could use the more specific code because... They said hypertriglyceridemia, and none of the codes use that exact word. Is it a synonym for the words I did see? Maybe, but I'm not smart enough to know. So, um, coding this case, I came up with three codes here. E1 1.9, type 2 diabetes without complications. 
The, the Z794, I was told I needed to add for the diabetes codes that this person is using insulin. And then I added hyperlipidemia unspecified. And this might be fine, but the thing is, I'm using an unspecified code, and an auditor might just say, you know what, today I'm going to audit every unspecified code that comes across my desk. Um, so I don't want them to do that if, if I can help it. So I'm a little concerned. Um, and I don't want them to have to read through this, this record. So here's the tool. Here's, here's the thing that you can do to simplify your lives. Um, you create a diagnostic statement like this one. Um, so I, I got rid of those words, uh, the paragraph. I didn't get rid of them. I should say I took and I added this summary, this problem statement or diagnostic statement at the end of my record that says, patient has type 2 diabetes mellitus without complications, current insulin use, and unspecified hyperlipidemia. I did this because I want to help out the, the reviewer. I want them to see what they're looking for. I don't want them to try to break it down and figure out if they agree with me. I just gave them this, and they'll just see this in the record and go, okay, I see what I'm looking for. You'll notice if you compare this to the codes, it's a perfect match. These are great. By the way, the word current is in parentheses in the code. Parenthetical um, notes like this are optional and not required, but in this case, I put it up there to make sure it's clear that it matches that code. If I didn't use the word current, it would still be fine. I'd have to use the words long term, but I'll tell you what, I wasn't sure if long term applied to this case because I couldn't tell from the record. So this brings up several questions I have as an auditor looking at this record. Were there really no diabetic complications or was it just not stated? You know, they didn't say they had any, so I chose the code without, and, and the IC10 guidelines tell us to use without as a default when we're not told. So that might have been correct, but I really wish the provider went to the trouble to simply say without complications. It would make me feel better, and I did that in the diagnostic statement. The other thing is they said they were taking insulin, but it wasn't clear to me whether it was temporary or long-term, and the code really does say long-term, so I wish they would clarify that and use the words current or long-term right in the record which I did in my diagnostic statement. And then this whole hyperlipidemia thing kind of bugged me because um, I looked at the code that was more specific and it had words that were close, but not quite what was in the record. And so I just don't know if I could use it. So I, bet, I, I just, to play it safe, I went with the unspecified code. So in this case, I would go back to that provider and say, hey, is it possible this patient actually has E7.8.1 instead of E7.8.5? And I can show them, here's the other things that are listed as inclusion terms under that code. Is this actually more accurate? And the provider goes, oh, well, actually, yeah, those are synonyms. You go, great, will you please use these words from now on? Please say elevated fasting triglyceride or endogenous hyperglyceridemia um, and ask them to use that from then on. So it's going to take a little bit of homework and someone really watching things closely to make sure these things are caught. But, but that's how you're going to avoid losing out in the case of an audit. You're, you're thorough. You look up what the codes really say. You make sure you know what the options are. Um, and if you do that, it should make it easier for everybody to pass through with flying colors. So when it comes to um, the 2017 ICD-10 coding changes in a week and a half, I wanted you to understand that there are a bunch of new revised and deleted codes, 2,700 of them, and you need to figure out which ones apply to you. Again, if you need to rewatch the beginning of this, this presentation um, to identify which ones you think you need to look more closely at. And I wanted you to understand the end of this grace period where we could kind of get away with using unspecified codes um, and no one was looking at our documentation means that we need to step up our game a little bit and we need to figure out what the codes offer and what kind of details are really there so that we can um, provide the right information and survive audits and everybody's happy and, and what happened to the patient is documented properly, which matches the claim properly, which means it can get processed by the payer properly and everybody lives happily ever after. So that's my, my take home message for you, live happily ever after, okay? Which means we're, we're up to a point now, we have a few minutes remaining, um, where I'm going to turn the time back over to Ken to see what kinds of questions we have. I know that some were sent in ahead of time and others may have been submitted during the presentation. And so I'm ready for your, your questions. We'll take them. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Gwilym. Um, just before we get into the questions, and while we allow a couple of minutes for everybody else who's wanting to ask a question to present them to us, um, these ICD-10 code changes, the additional new codes and uh, the codes that are being deleted, the updates will hit the QRMD system early next week. So QRMD system will have the, the complete set of codes, even the deleted ones, with the end date noted against them. So when you attempt to use an ICD-10 code, the system can warn you whether this is a code that's uh, usable on that data service or not. Uh, the provider-friendly terminology feature is turned on in most systems. Uh, if, you'd, if you need help to get that feature turned on, uh, that is going to allow you to do the same things that Dr. Williams was showing you, where you can drill down into a code based on attributes. Uh, you can use our wiki to look it up and, and 
turn it on yourself or use it yourself, or you can call into our support desk and we will help or walk you through that. Um, so one of the questions that we had earlier this morning, prior to the webinar even, was with respect to unspecified codes. And we've had another question that's similar. So Dr. William, the question was, uh, as a specialist, if, if I, I use a specific code for a particular diagnosis that I have, can I use an unspecified code for a comorbidity? Because I'm not sure what the specific code for that would be. Actually, that's a good question. And um, the short answer is yes. Um, because what we're instructed to do by the code book, by the guidelines, is code to the highest level of certainty. So if I'm a specialist and I'm treating something, I know the patient, let's say that I'm treating, I don't know, a patient's foot, and they also have diabetes, but I don't really know what's going on with the diabetes, or they have, they've had cancer or something, and you don't know, that's fine. You use the unspecified code in that case. Um, you can use unspecified codes when it is the most accurate information you have. Um, so don't be afraid of using them. Just be prepared for others to go, oh, well, all unspecifieds are bad, and they'll come after you. And you just say, no, look, I'm just following the rules. I used an unspecified because I wasn't certain. I'm not going to use a specific code when I can't support it. Only use specific codes when it's documented. And if you use an unspecified code, make sure your documentation only supports that, which is, which means you didn't know. So, so use them um, when appropriate. Great. Um, another question that we have is, are levels of specificity requirements going to be as closely scrutinized for a PCP as they would be for a specialist? Should I use a more specific diagnosis code uh, if, if my provider is a specialist? Um, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I don't know. Um, I think that's mostly up to the payers who are, who are looking at these records. And if you find that payers tend to pick on specialists more than PCPs, maybe because they're more expensive, then that could, could hold true. Um, again, I would just go back and say, if the provider documented it, it must be coded that way. And if the provider's documentation doesn't make it clear, then the provider needs to work on the documentation. So, I mean, the bottom line is the provider knows what it is or they don't. And if they don't know, then they should just say that in the record. They say, you know, I know it's diabetes, but I don't know much more about it um, because that's not what we're, we're treating here today. Then that's fine. Um, so I don't know that specialists will get picked on any more than PCPs. In fact, if I was a payer, um, and I was conducting audits and trying to take money back from clinicians, um, I would hit everybody. I would try to find which ones have the most errors, which ones have the most money attached, and I would attack those. You know, if that's, that's what I would do. So um, take that for what it's worth. And related to that, interestingly, we have a comment here um, where uh, George is letting us know that most commercial payers actually did not implement a grace period. So they were actually looking at all of uh, the claims in detail um, over the last year. So most providers from a commercial payer perspective uh, should already be receiving information if uh, there are any concerns with their coding. And uh, this will mostly be a change to Medicare claims. Do you agree with that, Dr. Right, right. Yeah, this is a Medicare thing. And so private payers could have been digging in a year ago or they could have waited like Medicare did um, or they could never look at it that closely. Uh, they, they might not dig heavier starting October 1st. Um, this, is, this is specific to Medicare, but we kind of are, are extrapolating and saying, here's what the trend is in the industry. Um, and, and what we're looking at is it's possible now that, that in general in the healthcare industry, they'll look beyond the claim. If they, might have, they might look at the claim and go, okay, you know what? I think they might have messed up on the documentation. I'm going to dig deeper and actually ask for documentation too and do audits. So, so that's our concern is if they go that extra level past the claim. They've been looking at claims. They've got them. But if they go beyond it, the claims better match the documentation, regardless of who the payer is. All right. Um, so uh, the next question that we have, uh, will Medicare update their guidelines and remove some of these unspecified codes? And I I'm going to answer yes to that. Uh, so for those of you who are using our Clean Scrubber, um, you will note that the Scrubber will get updated with new LCD and NCD guidelines. Uh, these have been published by Medicare, so the existing codes that are being deleted will be removed, and the new codes that are being added in are being updated in those guidelines, so there's a yes to that. Um, the next question is with respect to a registered dietitian who specializes I'm sorry, let me just jump over here, in providing nutrition therapy for patients with mental disorders. It seems BCBS requires that we use Z71.3 as the first diagnosis code. However, some claim reviewers understand that the code to be provision of preventive care with a three-year visit limit, and what do I do if it's not preventative? Is there a way around this issue? So this is a very specific question. Dr. Gulliam? And, and I can't answer that in a setting. I have to look up the codes and, and, and 
see what kind of guidelines they're referring to. That, um, and I apologize, but that's so specific, I just can't, I don't know, without doing a little bit of homework. So that's the kind of thing that would, would take a little bit more research to, to figure out for you. Great. Um, so a comment that we have is that, that it, it sounds like I have to completely code every diagnosis on every claim. This seems crazy. A bipolar person needs every bipolar symptom every time when they're repeated in patients. What would you say to that comment? Yeah, so I would refer back to ICD-10 guidelines, which say you should code for everything that affects your patient care or management during that encounter. So if the patient has, um, let's say the patient has, um, I don't know, some underlying condition. Um, they have cancer. Let's say they have cancer. Um, and I'm treating something that has nothing to do with the cancer. I don't have to mention, I mean, I should document that in their history, but I wouldn't code for cancer if it has nothing to do with the treatment I'm rendering in this encounter. Um, so you do not have to code for everything the patient has. You need to code for everything the patient has that affects your treatment at that encounter because, in theory, that allows the claims reviewer to look at that claim and get the whole story and go, oh, I see. For example, let me just throw out uh, the patient's pregnant, okay? Um, if the pregnancy has any impact on your treatment, you should go ahead and code for it. If it has nothing to do with it, you should document the patient's pregnant because it's important to note. Uh, it's just part of their health status. But if it has nothing to do with the reimbursement side of the condition you're treating, then don't code for it. That's what the guidelines tell us to do. But at the same time, you should code for everything that affects your patient's care, management, and treatment. That's uh, Section 4, Paragraph H of the official ICD-10 guidelines. Great. Okay. Um, so one last question. I do the billing and coding in a small psychiatric practice, and we typically only use only bill using F codes. I realize that there are applicable Z codes that relate to a patient's health status. Will we, required, will we be required to add these codes to claims? Um, so I am familiar with those. Uh, there are a lot of Z codes that apply in a behavioral health setting. And um, and I would, well, so I don't know about requirements and I don't know about Medicare's rules per se, but as a coder who who understands the codes and what they're trying to convey, I would suggest you would use those Z codes because uh, if they apply to your patients, I think that you should get familiar with them and see what's going on. Unless a payer guideline says don't use them or, or they don't apply. Um, but otherwise, I would suggest you do use every code that the best describes what's going on in your encounter because you want to tell the story on the claim form so that the, the, per, the payer gets it and doesn't have to come back further and look at your records and, and, and slow everything down and you just don't want to have to deal with that. Um, so use the codes if they're available to you and they accurately describe what really happened with your patient and what was documented. Right. The codes are there to help us, believe it or not. I know it's complex and it's kind of a mess, but you guys need to get paid at the end of the day. And so um, the codes once you get familiar with them, can be helpful and can help defend you and not necessarily be a weakness. So let them be your friends. Great. Um, a big thank you to everybody who's joined us today. A big thank you to, do, to you, Dr. William. Um, just before we end the session, and it'll end in just a minute, I want to mention that, you know, CareMD is working very hard on all the changes that are coming up with MACRA, MIPS, and alternative payment models. These are going, we're going to be releasing a lot of information to you guys over the next couple of weeks. And we hope that you can join us in future webinars where we'll be sharing that information in detail. Uh, look out for these changes. We hope that this transition goes as well as we expect it to. And, and if you have any questions and all the additional questions that we had today, we will make sure that we will get answers back to you, specifically to yourself, and also post it on the wiki. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for you know sacrificing your lunch hour. We appreciate your time. Have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye-bye.